Hello, welcome to Making Creativity Pay. With the Edinburgh Fringe in full swing, I spoke to a number of performers about the marketing and promotional aspects of the Fringe. Thanks very much for coming on the podcast. Can you tell us who you are and a little bit about the show? Hi, uh, my name is Laura. My show is called A Preoccupation with Romantic Love, and it is a one-woman play, um, a comedy drama, tragic comedy, <laughs> kind of. As a show, I've basically built around six voicemails from six ex-boyfriends, just a bunch of breakup voicemails telling a story across 10 years. So um, in the show, I am playing the voicemails to the audience and reacting to them and in doing so hoping to cleanse myself forever of my terrible terrible desire to be loved and it's very much about romantic preoccupation and uh compulsory heterosexuality oh compulsory heterosexuality uh and I think rejection as well, and like difficulties with rejection and perhaps rejection sensitivity dysphoria uh, specifically. And you know, it's it's funny and uh, feminist and uh, sad, <laughs> and it's quite sad. But you know, it's been um, touching hearts where it can. Have you performed at the Edinburgh Fringe before, or is this your first time? What kind of things are you looking forward to most? encounter with the fringe was as an edinburgh resident um so of fringes past i have been around working in cafes serving up avocado toast i did very short stint last year i think i did about eight shows in a pub in morningside and if you know edinburgh that went kind of about as well as you would think based on the title but i was looking at it i guess <laughs> in an edinburgh context being like oh morningside is actually quite central rather than thinking like well for the fringe edinburgh becomes like two streets so anyway there was no foot traffic there was really no audience so you know i did the show i had a nice time i saw a lot of interesting stuff but uh i really looked at this year as my first year of quite seriously doing it and yeah so the fringe i can't uh i don't have any knowledge of it from before maybe five years ago so seems the same to me i mean i think the biggest change that i've noticed would be like a shift in social media which is that like twitter used to play a huge huge role and how stuff was getting like promoted and shared. And now Twitter is sort of like um, a rotting husk of a corpse. And instead, I think people are on TikTok. So I tried to make TikToks, but um, a bit behind the curve with that. And oh, it's bigger. It gets bigger and bigger, right? Every single year. And more expensive and harder and harder for people to find places to stay. I've never been like looking for a flat just for the fringe. So I can't really speak to that. But I know it is difficult. But then also, obviously, there are a lot of difficulties renting in Edinburgh um, for people year round. When it comes to flyering, what's your strategy? Do you spray and pray or are you a bit more targeted? My flyering technique is to flyer by myself um, because I am a team of one and there is, uh, there is no money <laughs> for anything um, other than like what I can physically do with my one human body. So I am firing for myself. I am firing near my venue. My venue has been down on Leith Walk um, and I'm now moving to a venue that's on the South Bridge quite close to the mile. But while I've been on Leith Walk, I don't fancy my skills of persuasion to be to the point that I'm going to talk somebody down from the mile to Lee's walk, you know? I think that would be a very hard thing to do. Like last year when I did the show in Morningside, I tried to flyer a bit in town and that didn't work because, you know... <laughs> distance. I flyer like one person outside my venue last year who came and saw the show. But you know, I probably saw one person outside my venue who came and saw the show. <laughs> it's like there was there was no foot traffic out in Morningside. So for the second part of my run, I will be on the South Bridge and I'll be flying there probably before the show, probably not more than an hour before the show because I have a day job and I have to continue to be doing my day job. Don't have all day to stand out and hand out flyers. And I will be flying there and I will be doing my best to greet people with a good sense of humanity and politeness and intrigue and trying not to cry because flying is like a one-on-one -on -one direct intense like experience of rejection, constant 
little micro bits of of rejection. And uh, that can really suck. And you have to stay alert and you have to stay focused and like human and friendly and not fully dissociate from your body, but you have to dissociate like a little bit or like you will cry. So the people who are really good at it are veterans who like stuff can't hurt them anymore. Like they've been doing this for years and years. But I just try and talk to people. I, I, I say, would you like to, can I talk to you about a play that I've written? And sometimes people stop and sometimes they don't stop. And I'm not too bothered about that because I know that there's no point in handing a flyer to someone who does not actively want one. It's just a waste of paper. If they do not want to stop and talk to me, they will not like read a flyer that I hand them like against their will. Like that will just like go in the bin, you know? So I'm looking for people to engage with the art and engage with the performance. And if they are up for that, then that is like, truly, truly a wonderful thing. But if not, you just, you can't take it personally and you trudge on and you continue along and you, you, you do your best. When it comes to promotion on social media, what kind of things do you tend to use? Are you all over everything or do you particularly use a particular platform? I do not have much of a social media presence. I have no skill for cultivating that. I tend to just sort of drop off from social media for like months at a time. Um, and staying plugged in has proved fairly impossible for me, but I think I hear of shows that are selling out like from TikTok, and I'm like, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Uh, so I've made some TikToks, um, just like from my garden being like, hi, I'm in my garden. Here's a poem. Um, and believe it or not, those haven't gone viral, which is shocking. Uh, like what but the fringe like i said earlier it used to like run off twitter like all the reviews were on twitter all the critics were on twitter the audiences were on twitter and now that twitter is zombified i don't know where people are i've downloaded threads i have 38 followers on threads i keep forgetting to post there i'm definitely on instagram um Again, not as much as I should be, but uh, I'm on Instagram. I'm watching people's stories. I like Instagram stories, so I like making them and I like watching them. Um, And I've been posting like an update every day of the Fringe that I've done, just kind of like a little thing. But I guess anyone reading that, I don't know. I met somebody last year who told me he didn't even flyer. He just like boosted uh, an Instagram post. And I, I actually don't think it worked all that well for him. Like he seemed like very like confident that he'd done the right thing, but it was just sort of like, I don't know if people would really respond to that. I think it's a mixture of everything. I think ultimately at the heart of it, it's, um, persona. Like, do you have one? Can you get one? (laughs) And support, I think as a sort of solo artist, it's like a whole other, a whole other minefield than if you have like a a, a proper sort of team of people working together to put together a show. And also I think social media naturally works better for people who are doing, for stand-ups, people who are doing comedy, obviously, because what do you want to watch in like a bite-sized portion? Like some jokes, right? Yeah, social media is massively important and I am bad at it. And one day I will learn and I will just be on TikTok and everything will be great. So for the venue you're performing at, was there anything in particular that drove the decision to go there? I am not uh, paying my venue. You know, I have a, I'm with the Free Fringe. We have a a fun, kind of different way of doing things. (laughs) Here's the thing with my show. Um, and, uh, if you, you come and see it, you will, you will love it, but, um, people leave it feeling extremely, um, in an, a very heightened emotional place and it does not work with a bucket speech. Like people are just sort of walking out in a daze. The show is dark and disorienting and will fill you with feelings. And so, yeah, doing the bucket speech afterwards has proved kind of awkward. Uh, I do my best. But I've seen people who are doing a really, really good job about it. And they are doing a lot of the things that you are not supposed to do um, if you're doing the free fringe. I have seen people saying stuff like, uh, not ratting on anyone specifically, but just these are some of the tropes, which is that you say, oh, it's free to enter, um, but it's not free to leave. Or a suggested amount. People will say, I suggest you give me five to ten pounds. We are, if you are part of the free fringe as an organization, we are really not meant to do that. 
that um, the show is free. Like we are not meant to pressurize people and we're not meant to, you know, but I assume that does help because I think people do better with their buckets than I do. If I crack it one of these days, but uh, the main thing I try to do with a bucket speech is sort of just emphasize that I'm really trying to cover costs, that it's quite expensive to do the fringe, be at the fringe, no matter how you're doing it. And if you are able to give anything towards what would have been a ticket price, it's just hugely, hugely significant for me. And it is, but I, bucket speech for me is not about cornering people and it's not about trying to, you know pressurize people either because I'm very happy if somebody has just come to see the show and if you can't give me any money for whatever reason that doesn't require an explanation but you know I would just come up and say hi maybe um if you can't or leave a review or a tweet if we're still tweeting like that really really helps too I think the thing with the bucket speech if somebody doesn't put any money in your bucket it can sort of leave you feeling like they hated the show and that's not necessarily true right just people have a lot of reasons why especially this year I'm really seeing I think cost of living reflected in the amounts people are able to give and also like people being kind of like sheepish about it and like I get it I totally get it but you know the best thing you can do if you've been to see a free show and you really can't pay the best thing you can do is to use your word of mouth and to use your social media and to use your network to bring more people to that show and that's like the the best gift that you can give it, it's sort of like every person who comes to see the show for me is like a huge gift and that makes this this whole process so much more manageable I do not think I could do. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where life takes me. But doing a ticketed show, I don't know. It would be very different. But I would feel very underconfident that I could consistently fill that ballroom, you know, and uh, you don't want to throw the ball before you know that you can fill the ballroom. So I think that's part of what makes the the free fringe so important and so special is it gives people the opportunity to bring up um like experimental and new work from like unproven artists or people who don't have followings who don't have clout to be at the fringe and engage with the community here and try out new work and not literally be in debt for it because they are competing in like the one of the largest arts marketplaces in the world. You know, I don't feel ready to I mean, I never feel ready to actually engage in that competition. Certainly not on my own. I have a play I'd like to do one of these days that has more than just me in it. And maybe if we had a Wii team that it would seem much more tenable. But yeah, I think if I had ticket sales, I would be refreshing those ticket sales manically. And I do not judge anyone who does. I, yeah, I'm just here to get whatever audience I can, share my share my work with people, go and see other people's stuff, and just try and have a nice time of it. And I have kind of the freedom to do so based on my like very particular set of circumstances where I'm not uniquely paying for accommodation. Are there any particular shows you're looking forward to see or any posters or promotions you've seen? I gotta see that. Diana, the untrue story. Because <laughs> I I don't know. I've seen the sort of the sort of street performance stuff they've been doing with the costumes and it just seems like quite fantastic. But I have been, like I say, I've been doing my day job and my showdown on Leith Walk. So I haven't seen all that much. I haven't really been flyered that much to. When I get up into town, when I'm on the South Bridge in town on Saturday, I am sure, I am sure that I will see so much more that is really quite exciting. I... I'm going to go see King of Moor, uh, Veza. I haven't picked a date yet, but uh, King of Moor has been doing a great thing with being a human flyer. So they're like in costume and they just have the QR code on them and no flyers, just like come up and scan the QR code. And I think that's really fun. And I always look for, I'm always excited to see ways that we might find a way to do the festival and not literally print a billion flyers to just go immediately into the bin. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to being up again uh being up and around 
on Saturday and being on the mile and seeing what all has been going on because I've been seeing a lot of interesting sort of performance art stuff. Yeah, I think that speaks to me as a person. I am not super online. If I'm going to see a show, it's probably going to be because I saw you in person doing something interesting with your flyer. I haven't I haven't gotten itinerary for the rest of it. I'm going to be walking around mostly for late night stuff and just seeing like what excites me. Oh, and I saw a really a great thing at the Free Fringe with at the Banshee Labyrinth where all the the best and wackiest stuff is always on. It's called like The Master where um the performer he is dressed as a vampire and you walk into the Banshee Labyrinth and he hands you a hand-tied scroll invitation inviting you to attend his lair and I don't need to tell you that's fantastic. Um so that's it. 9.50 p.m. every day at the Banshee Labyrinth. So go there around 9 o'clock, and a man dressed as a vampire will hand you a little scroll, very elegantly tied with a red ribbon, and you should follow him. Thanks very much for taking part. Have a great fringe. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this, check out our other episodes where we speak to a number of performers about their experiences at the Edinburgh Fringe, as well as with creatives in other industries about making creativity pay.